The Georgia Department of Education, the High Museum of Art, and Georgia Public Broadcasting are excited to bring you this video series on visual literacy for the Advanced Placement Classroom. I'm Bonnie Marshall with the College Readiness and Talent Development Unit of the Georgia Department of Education. And I'm Kate McLeod, Head of School and Teacher Services at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. This video series is designed to provide instructional strategies for teaching visual literacy in the Advanced Placement Classroom. Teachers can use these strategies to help students interpret and write about non-text resources, to plan a virtual museum field trip, or to structure and follow up an actual field trip to a museum. In this series, five very successful advanced placement teachers will discuss and demonstrate how they would use the art in their classrooms. The first video provides an overview of the strategies as each teacher discusses how they would approach the same work of art through the lens of six different subject areas. The final video records the actual gallery walk in which a museum educator carefully explains the background and details of each work discussed in the series. It is a significant companion piece that illustrates how easily information unfolds through both observation and inquiry. The presenters have purposely chosen selections that may not present all the answers or that may even be controversial, allowing an opportunity for students to weigh all the facts carefully. The presenters will remind us several times throughout the series that the strategies and activities presented can be effectively used in any classroom, not just the advanced placement class. Another key reminder is the importance of field trips to see the art and artifacts in person. Even though there are wonderful virtual opportunities available, we encourage you to seek out museums in your area so students can experience the art firsthand. We partnered with our local museum, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. The High Museum of Art is happy to be collaborating with the Department of Education and Georgia Public Broadcasting on this endeavor. Every year, the High serves 60,000 pre-kindergarten to high school students and teachers through guided tours, workshops, and professional learning experiences. We hope you enjoy these instructional videos and be sure to check out more resources and professional learning opportunities at high.org. If you're not able to make it to the high, check out your local museum's educational offerings. We hope you will find this series helpful. The links to the videos can be found on the educational resource pages of Georgia Department of Education, the High Museum of Art, and Georgia Public Broadcasting. Now we will hear from Kendra McGill, who will begin the overview. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Kendra McGill. I'm an AP art history teacher, and I'm gonna start us off today on our visual literacy adventure, so get excited. Uh, when we all came together in the beginning to discuss how we were actually going to approach visual literacy through all our different disciplines, um, I am an art teacher, so I have a very set way of approaching art that I thought was completely different than everybody else, the other academic areas. So when they were discussing how they teach um, an image for an essay and how do they teach their students to approach this image, it was shocking because it's exactly what art teachers do every single day. So. Uh, Edmund Feldman is like renowned in the art world. He developed this art criticism technique in the late 60s, early 70s. And you can see it's a description, analysis, interpretation, and judgment. Ironically, and if I was better, this would be an, an awesome Venn diagram, but <laughs> the uh, other disciplines approach writing about visual imagery in the same exact way. There's a little differences here and there, but essentially we're all approaching it as the first step as description. And you guys did that all this morning. You probably didn't even realize it, but Jinya did a great job as we went around the uh, museum asking questions, asking you to observe. What do you see? What do you notice? What, why is that there? What else stands out? That is all part of the first step of description, looking for things. And then we go into two different types of analysis for art history, of course it's going to be a little bit different, um, then interpretation for both ways, and then finally our judgment and synthesis bringing it all together on what exactly are we looking at and what does it mean. So I'm going to start us off with description. So the first thing I want you to notice, we were standing in front of this painting earlier. What do you notice that's different than the actual painting? 
Well, it's so much darker. So much darker. Right. What else? How did the colors look? Flat. Muted. It's muted. Right. So I want you to be aware, especially art history teachers, that what you're projecting, even if this is a super high resolution from the High Museum, and it's still not giving us that experience of standing in front of the work of art and what actually is going on. We can't see anything back here. Right? But when we were in front of the painting, you could see so much. So as we did, as we went through the museum, we're describing our first things. I put a link to Google Art. Almost every work of art in the High Museum is on Google Art. Same with the Met, same with, I mean, almost every work of art is on there. And what you can do is zoom in to the most minute details to see every brush stroke, every little part of this painting, and the kids can explore it on their own and zoom around. So Google Art is a great tool to have um, just as an access point for your, your students, and they can just do it right on their phones. So what do you see? This painting, as we know, is filled with things. So how I approach a painting like this um, is I play a game, like categories, and I take 30 seconds of absolute silence, and we just look at the work of art, digest it, because kids are so used to Twitter, uh, Snapchat, where things are, they're just scrolling through these things so quickly, they never pause to actually look at what's happening. So to just take 30 seconds, which to them will seem like eternity, um, and look at this and what's going on. And then we take out a piece of paper, and this isn't appropriate for every image, but this one it would work with, and write down everything you see. And so obviously, like everyone here would probably list globe. So then I call out, okay, who has a globe? Cross it off. And we go through, and that way it becomes a game. Who can find the most images within this image? And, um, and then they get like a piece of gum. And you, you know, teenagers, anything for food, they're all in. So uh, it, it gets them going. It gets them to really start looking. I also, to help with this process of looking at art, is at the end of every period, I show the next three images that I'm gonna teach the next day. And I don't say a word, we just look at them in silence for about a minute. I mean, it's a pretty long time in total silence. And we might discuss a little bit, but that's how I end the class period so the next day they've had time to digest that imagery before they actually start learning about it. As an artist, it was really interesting to hear the history teachers, the Lane teachers, and how you all discussed and described this, which, yes, you mentioned a lot of things that I would have mentioned as well, but what shocked me was no one mentioned the color palette. Um, this is a very warm painting, lots of oranges and browns and things, but if you notice the woman is white and blue, we have blue shoes here, we have a little white and blue here, and then it's hard to tell in this image, but there's blue here. Those are the only cool spots in the painting. So what the artist has done, he's drawing our eye around the composition just by doing that, by the placement of those colors of blue, because that's all they are. And then this white spot complements the large white area of the woman standing here. Um, the style of painting very realistic. That's something your students should be able to recognize. It's not abstract like some of the other works we looked at. Uh, the, where the light source is coming. We have a dual light source. We have the light coming from the window. We have the light source coming from like where we are standing as the viewer looking in. And then the setting. Where is this? Is it in a house? Is it in an office? What's happening? So these are all part of the description that you would discuss before going into analysis because you really need to see what's going on to understand everything else that's going to happen next. My name is Robbie Davis and I will be uh, presenting the English language and composition perspective and I'm going to be talking about conversations, connections, and contexts, both in this presentation and the one coming up a little bit later on. Now, our students in AP Lang encounter images specifically on question one of the exam, the synthesis question. And that question gives students a set of sources that they are to use in constructing an essay response. One or two of the sources that they encounter could be an image of a, a, an artwork, for instance, it could be. Now, for responding to that, uh, uh, to that essay prompt, 
we as teachers uh, encourage our students to think of the sources as voices in a conversation, a conversation about the issue at hand, right? And their essay should reflect that conversation among sources. So with this idea in mind, we're going to talk about the expansionist, right? All right, the expansionist. As, as she said, we've, we've done our observations. We've, done, we've gone through that first step of the process. We've collected all these images here, okay? The conversations and connections among the things, among the details in the painting, create a, a sort of a narrative, don't they? A narrative that leads us to some understanding about what the artist's point is here. But we want our students to also make connections with things they already know, the, the, the knowledge they bring to the painting. So for instance, I'm gonna just pick one thing out of the painting and, and let's sort of play with this idea. I'll pick the desk. All right, take a look at that desk. We've seen that desk before, haven't we? Yeah, it's not a flat top desk. It's not a desk. He's, you know, he's not a scholar, is he? No, we've seen that desk. We've seen it where? It's Scrooge's desk. We've seen it, has it, right? We've seen it in A Christmas Carol. We know that desk. That's an accounting desk, isn't it? Well, that, I mean, that is the point, right? We know that that's what he's doing. He's taking stock of all the stuff he has collected. It, I mean, isn't that beautiful? Everybody recognizes that type of desk that we see there. Uh, what about one other image or one other aspect of the image? Let's talk about the woman. The woman. Um, about her stance and her body language. What do you, what, what do you think about that, so just to begin with? Stand up, this table, stand up real quick and do what she's doing real quick. Put your hands behind your back and notice she's looking over at him. She doesn't look like she's angry, does she? Right? Body language experts say that that hand behind your back thing is confidence. Does that make you feel confident? Look at that. It says it, says it speaks of confidence. And look at her. She's looking at him. It's, it's like she's waiting very patiently for him to do whatever it is that he's doing, right, as she stands there. Okay, now, you ready? Compare this figure to the figure of the woman in the painting. Are there any connections? Do these things converse? Do they say anything to each other? What do you see immediately, a connection between the two? The colors. Exactly right. Now, we all know what this is. This is Columbia Pictures, right? And we know that the figure is, in fact, Columbia, the feminine representation of the, of Amer of the Americas, of the United States even. And this color scheme, this blue and white color scheme, was traditionally how a Columbia was depicted. Many art historians and critics say that that's what Millet is doing here, that this is Columbia, that she represents the United States, the West, so to speak, in a room filled with all this stuff from the East. That's pretty cool, isn't it? In fact, um, we could look at other pictures of Columbia. There she is with her blue and her white, and you know, she's everywhere. She predates Uncle Sam, in fact. She was the image of America before there was an Uncle Sam. The most famous painting that's often compared to this one is this famous one. Do you recall it? You see it? American Progress? That too is Columbia. And I'd love to spend time having a conversation with you about what they say to each other and how they connect. How are they different? This passive figure and this very active figure, right? Uh, what do they say in comparison to one another? Well, are there issues and arguments that this painting might be appropriate for? On the uh, uh, the DOE website, they have this practice, uh, uh, this practice prompt for the uh, American Literature EOC. And it's like a miniature uh, synthesis question because there are only two reading passages. But look at the question. Weigh the claims on both sides and write an argumentative essay in your own words supporting one side of the debate in which you argue either that museums must return cultural treasures to their country of or origin if that country requests it or if that me, or that museums do sometimes have the right to deny those requests. This issue of collecting artifacts from other cultures. This painting could be uh, a, a, a part of the conversation, could it not? And finally, what might you do if you were to throw up these assertions, these quotations, these assertions like we see on the argument prompt from Fight Club, the things you own end up owning you. Bertrand Russell, it is preoccupation with possessions more than anything else that prevents us from living freely and nobly. Or maybe this one from Hamish Bowles. I love this. Possessions. The very word is potent. To possess. Possession. Possessed. 
Isn't that a great quotation? How, would, how do these assertions converse and connect with the painting? And here's Abraham Lincoln. The love of property and consciousness of right and wrong have conflicting places in our organization, which often makes a man's course seem crooked, his conduct a riddle. Right? It's a wonderful opportunity to have them to converse and to unpack these, uh, these assertions in that way. Okay? So continuing on with the expansionist and going along with what Robbie was saying, um, I'm Joni Jameson and I'm going to talk about AP Lang and Seminar and Lit through the same analysis lens. So what we're looking at is the lenses of each of these three courses and out how you use those to analyze the pieces. So you pull out the woman over here and you start talking about how she is representative of Columbia. And when you do that, how are you looking at that? Are you looking at that from a cultural perspective? Was the artist talking to you through a cultural perspective? What is the lens? What are you bringing with you to see the piece? And it could be economic. When you go back to Scrooge, is this, total, is this focus completely on the economics of expanding across the world, what we're doing in, in the Far East? Is it just the Far East? Is the, does the globe, does that tell you more? Is there an environmental cost? Even in this painting, you can bring in an environmental lens. And this is one of the things the kids can do on lit and lying and seminar. The kids are gonna to come to it from where they're standing. And one of the things the art can do is it helps them understand they are standing somewhere. From somewhere, wherever it is, their viewpoint is going to be shadowed by the way, what they bring with them. And so the more aware they are of their lens, the more depth they can get into their analysis. And the other thing they can do is analyze how other people are going to view this. When they start talking about, I'm viewing this through an economic standpoint, and these are the things I see, and these are the things this says to me, and this is the new argument I can now make, I'm having a conversation with someone that sees this politically. So now we're gonna have to find some common ground between these two lenses of looking at the expansionist, which certainly can go into political. So some of the questions the kids can start with would tie to those particular lenses. So, so um, for example, economic. How, in, how did and do people benefit economically from the expansion of the West? It's not just then, it's also now. We can start talking about how this statement on expansionism hasn't gone away. We're still talking about expansionism today. The kids can start bringing in other pieces, start bringing in things they've read, something they saw in the news and current events. And these are those conversations that can start from a visual image that will resonate with the student. You can go all the way down through here. You've got futuristic. How will international relations be impacted by the West's growing global influence? Well, how prevalent is that today? And we can start talking about how this begins some of the relationships we have across the globe today. And students can make a beautiful argument. When they're writing an argument in AP Lang, they bring their own evidence. And their evidence doesn't have to be the written word. It can be the visual word. They can bring in this piece. They can use those descriptions we mentioned already. They can bring in that analysis and they can bring new knowledge to the conversation about whether it be economic or political or where we are in the future. Hi everyone, I'm Jose Gregory and I'm going to talk about AP U.S. history and specifically I'm going to focus on two things. Number one, contextualization and number two, synthesis. And what exactly does that mean in the AP U.S. history classroom? So we're going to start with a very basic definition that you can use with your kids. When they are analyzing um, any type of visual, they need to make connections to broader phenomena or contemporaneous events in order to understand what we would call the big picture. But what's really important that I really want to emphasize is that it's not going to be enough for them to just be able to identify that particular connection. They're gonna have to be able to explain the historical significance behind that. Simply put, when we're looking at context, we're looking at time and place. So we're gonna look at why that time and that place might be significant or relevant to the larger picture that we're trying to um, answer. In this case, we started off with the expansionists, right? 
So what is happening in the United States during this time period, 1899? Perhaps we could go a little bit broader. What is happening during this time period in the Western Hemisphere? And even take it to a global context. What is happening around the world in 1899? So I want you to think about that for a couple of seconds before I give you some possible answers. And this is what students would have to do in the AP US History classroom, trying to make that connection and really try to focus on why does this matter? Why is it relevant? So why do we really care? So let's see if some of my possible answers are what some of you came up with. Clearly, as far as our nation is concerned, I want my students to make the connection to the Spanish-American War. Right? In 1898, this is painted in 1899. I want them to make the connection to the conflict in the Philippines. <coughs> Clearly, there's an excess when we had seen all of these items that represent the um, East. I also want them to put it within the context economically of the depression that is happening during the 1890s and the panic in 93 because that might be relevant to the fact that we might be looking for overseas expansion so that we can have access to additional markets. And that's how they're gonna put it into context. I would want my kids to also make a connection to Frederick Jackson Turner's The Frontier Thesis. If we no longer have any other place to discover within the continental United States, clearly there might be a need as to why we might wanna to go to Puerto Rico, try to get Cuba, try to get the Philippines, not just the Hawaiian Islands, and then Alaska as well. And I also want them to draw a connection to Alfred Thayer Mahan's Sea Power Theory. Why is it that the country that might control the sea might be able to continue to write the narrative of the world a little bit more than others? If we're looking at the region, I want them to start thinking that this is right before the Panama Canal. The French and the British are already trying to do this, and eventually we know that Teddy Roosevelt is gonna come in and become the first modern president and get the job done. Globally, there is this imperial competition that is taking place. Europeans in Africa, as um, Ryan might be mentioning later on, with examples like the naval arms race and the Moroccan crisis in Asia, and we all cover this in AP US, there's the open door policy and the Boxer Rebellion. But I really want to emphasize this last point at the bottom, the note, students need to explain that connection. They need to go beyond the mere identification because you're really trying to get them to engage in analytical writing. And when they're analyzing something, they have to go beyond that description. The second thing is synthesis. And again, a simple, straightforward, kid-friendly definition. In their analysis, they're gonna have to make connections to something else, to other historical contexts, to another geographical area, to another period, another era, including the present, or to another theme or another approach to history. So the way that I see this, instead of time and place, like I said with contextualization before, is across not only time and place, but also themes and or approaches. So it really depends how the student is using it. There could be some type of overlap between contextualization and synthesis. So what is this similar to before and after? So if the time period is 1899, when this work of art was created, does it remind them of something that happened before 1899 or after? Is it similar to what might have taken place in another geographical area? And is there another relevant theme and or approach? So I want you to take a couple of seconds to think about that in your own head. If you were making a connection to another area or to another time period before or after 1899, what would be a possible answer? And this is what I would expect my students to connect in AP US history. Territorial expansion that happened prior to the American Civil War, all the way back to 1803 and the Louisiana Purchase. But the more natural connection for me that I would expect my kids to make is that of Manifest Destiny and the Mexican-American War and Session, right? We see the Spanish-American War as a continuation or a second wave of Manifest Destiny. I think this is a great connection, going back to what Robbie had mentioned before with American progress. That's probably a visual that I would have definitely used in the classroom previously so that the kids can um, not only see that connection but connect the dots fully place European colonization in a different geographical area, as we mentioned before, perhaps in Africa or in Asia, 
And for a theme or an approach, it would have to be one that is not the focus of the essay. So if the essay is focusing on political, economic, or social issues, and then the student is able to bring up anything cultural and intellectual, that would extend or modify their original argument beyond the prompt, and that would be considered synthesis. Finally, I would point out that just like contextualization, it is not enough that the students identify it. They have to explain the connection that exists between the Mexican-American War, let's say, and the Spanish-American War. And next up, we're going to have Ryan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jose. I'm Ryan Dennison, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the second part of uh, synthesis from an AP European perspective. Um, we know that synthesis is one of the nine historical thinking skills. Um, historical thinking involves the ability to develop understanding of the past by making mean meaningful and persuasive historical and or cross-disciplinary connections between a given historical issue and other historical contexts, periods, themes, or disciplines. And uh, at the reading, we, we know that the synthesis is one of the things that our students have a hard time achieving a point for in our new system of grading. Uh, so we, we're, re, we really want to know uh, how our kids can get that synthesis point. Um, in the AP Social Studies, since the redesign, we're now all on the same page, and we have similar ways of getting synthesis. Uh, as Jose talked about, the first two are in U.S. history, uh, and then the third one is for European and world only. So we have a third way in AP Euro and world in which to achieve our synthesis point for our kids. And uh, as we were making this project happen uh, with Kendra giving us Feldman's critique, we were amazed at how readily it all fell kind of together between what we do and what art criticism does already. Uh, even though synthesis in the AP histories is just a little bit different because we're looking to get that point in the essay. Okay? So for European and world, uh, we can use of use of insights from a different discipline or field of inquiry, such as economics, government, and politics, art history, or anthropology, to better understand a given historical issue. And I think that you could add more subjects to that uh, list, uh, not just those themselves. Okay. So in the first uh, synthesis point, making connections uh, with, between a given historical issue, we can look at it from the synthesis of AP Euro and AP US. You'd like for the student to make connections to differing time periods, as Jose talked about time and place. And of course, we've already seen uh, the symbolism of Columbia and the expansionists um, and the idea of John Gast's American progress, which here we have uh, the expansionists in 1899, and then of course John Guest's, which would be in 1872. You have two different time periods, both using the same symbolism along the theme of expansionism. Okay. And there's American Pro Progress by John Guest, 1872. Okay. The second point of synth synthesis, making connections between different course themes and our approaches to history, such as political, economic, social, cultural, intellectual. Uh, again, this would have to be something different from the theme in the question. Okay? Whereas the theme of the expansionist uh, is expansionism, the student could look through the image easily making connections through the theme of economics or social cultural differences uh, to uh, mercantilism, uh, to the Atlantic trade, to the Columbian exchange, uh, or the early expansion of, of the Europeans. Uh, Portuguese, etc. So that's another way that the student could change themes and achieve the synthesis point. Okay. <clears throat> and for AP World and uh, AP European, using insights from a different discipline or field of inquiry. So in, in your own world, the student could bring in other disciplines, uh, art history to discuss the ten continuing theme of expansion and trade that was glorified in European art. And I particularly, one of the first things that came to my mind was the Ambassadors uh, by Hobine, uh, kind of e emphasizing that e exploration uh, theme, expansionism of, of Europe and the lucrative nature of it. Uh, the mercantilist idea of enrichness, which you could also tie back to the expansionist with all of the uh, little trinkets and things that we were talking about earlier uh, in the painting when we looked at it in, in the gallery. 
The student could use government to discuss how the government encouraged in expansion and trade, and uh, a couple of things came to mind. Uh, the granting of monopolies by the government to private companies to extend trade, the Dutch East India Company, the British East India Company, and that would be another uh, way that the uh, student could achieve the synthesis point. And then for uh, the last example I had, the student could use psychology and economics to discuss the trends which led to European demand for all things Asian, African, or Indian. It became kind of like once these exotic goods came in, it became all the vogue and everybody wanted them. Sort of like the tulip in the Dutch culture, okay? um, where you have this plant brought from Asia. Everybody was like, oh, it's just a flower. But then the tulip craze of, of the Dutch in the early 17th century took on a whole new meaning. And these things became uh, even uh, more wealthy or had more monetary value than houses. Okay. Uh, we could talk then about economic bubbles and the bursting of the bubble and all the effects from that as well. Okay. And there's the painting of uh, the ambassadors by Hans Holbein to be able to make those connections. Okay. And now, since we're done with the Feldman's criticism and trying to tie it all together with all the disciplines, we're each going to go into our separate disciplines for the next presentations.